and welcome to another treatment of the International Sunday School lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, God Creates Heavens and Earth. And we're starting the fall quarter. Uh, this is for September the 2nd, 2018. And the lesson, of course, is taken from Genesis, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. And we're going to be talking about the first three days of creation. Okay? Now, a little background information about uh, this week and next week. And we I probably could spend the entire lesson just giving you background information. Uh, the first, uh, uh, first two chapters of Genesis uh, is got some of the most important concepts that you can find in the Bible, all bound up in it. Uh, also, too, there are a lot of different ways that you can interpret those first two chapters of Genesis. And at one point in time in my life, I would uh, engage in all kinds of uh, vigorous debates about how you could interpret those verses of the Bible. I've backed off a little bit of being so argumentative about the way that you can interpret the first two chapters of the Bible. Uh, let me tell you um, how I interpret those verses and the way that I, the approach that I take in understanding in those verses. And um, just so you have a, a clear understanding where I'm coming from, uh, my interpretation of those verses are that you take the verses uh, very literally. Uh, I very literally believe there were six days in the creation of the known universe, the universe as we know it, and that... Uh, God went through the progressive order that is outlined in those uh, verses of Genesis. There are also, when he created it, just because of the way space-time works, when he spoke these things into existence, they were spoken into existence as if they had existed for billions of years. So in other words, uh, when God spoke the earth into existence, there was already, in the earth that was created, there were evidences of erosion, of mountain ranges coming up and coming down and whatever, as if it had just naturally been there for billions of years. So that's one of the reasons why that when scientists go out, geologists go out and they see different things, they see evidences of this, that, and yon looking as if the earth had been here for a lot longer than it uh, actually has been here. And if you... Um, if you just looking at things logically, uh, if you think about the stars in the sky, if God had not spoken a um, a old universe into existence, then it would have taken years and years and years and years for the starlight to reach the earth. So by the fact that God uh, spoke an old universe into existence, 
the uh, 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 seemingly old universe into existence, starlight was immediately there. Uh, you know, and but there's other ways that people can interpret the 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 first two chapters of Genesis, and I don't get bent out of shape uh, worrying with uh, how people can interpret those first couple of chapters of Genesis. You know, for example, uh, there are some people who interpret the the first two chapters of Genesis as more symbolic. And if you look at the uh, order of the creation of the world, uh, it follows almost the same order that geologists and and evolutionary biologists um, talk about. And you can, you know, and these people interpret the Hebrew word yom, which is what was translated as days, as being an age and not a full 24-hour day. Um, You know, I don't agree with that, but I don't get bent out of shape uh, with people and and claim they're not a Christian if they if they agree if they believe that, um, you know you could be a Christian and 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 believe that. The only thing that you have to believe is that God is the creator of the uh, universe, and He's the originator of life, and that the Bible is a hundred percent true. And uh, you can interpret th- some things a little bit differently and still be saved. I don't agree with that, with that interpretation of, the, of these uh, ep- epoch days, as some people call it. I don't agree with that interpretation, but I'm not going to get into a big debate with anybody over it. The same way with the gap theory. Um, uh, in fact, I used to be a, a proponent of the gap theory. And then what that is, is that there's a gap between uh, the first little section of the first couple of verses of Genesis and, and the rest of it. And that God had created a pre-Adamic world and that's where Satan was and Satan ruled over that world, and when he was uh, when he messed up, that the world was destroyed, and that God was actually just recreating the world uh, in the account that we read in Genesis. You know, and there were a couple of really prominent Bible scholars I've got a lot of respect for, uh, Schofield being one of them, Dake being another that I have a lot of respect for, who believe that. Uh, But I think that if you have to pretty much well stress the interpretation of the Scriptures pretty heavily to agree, to to believe that. Um, You know, there again, if you believe it, then I'm not going to argue with you about it. Um, It's just that I, I like to take the Scriptures and interpret them in the most direct way possible and the most literal way possible and the way to do the way to interpret uh, the book of Genesis as I see it is taking it quite literally on its face value and these are the day one was this day two is that day three is that days four is that, day five is that, day six is that, and then God rested on the seventh day. I, you know, just take it exactly the way, just take it exactly how as it, as it reads. Um, and that's pretty much well how I interpret that, or interpret the, the creation days. But anyhow, um, you know, if you buy into the gap theory, um, you know, you've got uh, some very prominent 
Bible scholars who agree with you. You've also got some pretty prominent Bible scholars who disagree with you. Not including myself in that because I'm definitely not a prominent Bible scholar, but I disagree with you. Uh, the only thing that's, that's really critical is acknowledging that God is the creator of the universe and that Christ Jesus participated in that creation, the act of creation, uh, participated in the act of creation, and believing that God's in control, God has a plan, and that uh, the original sin happened in the Garden of Eden, and there were consequences, and death was passed upon the human race because of that original sin. Uh, those are the most pro the most important things that we have to um, understand from those initial two chapters of the Bible. Okay, well let's go ahead and start working our way through the days here. Genesis one and two, the first chapter of Genesis, first and second verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, let's notice a couple of things. Um, regardless how anybody interprets anything, Let's underscore a key part that God is the one who created the universe, the world, and everything. And let's also underscore this theological reality, theological truth. God has no beginning he is the only he is the only being in the universe who does not have a, a point of origin he goes all the way back through infinity without any origin it is. It makes no sense when people talk about, well, where did God come from? God did not come from anywhere because he did not come into being. He has always been. Okay? Now, let's notice something else. How that God, after he created the heavens and the earth, that he was brooding on the face of the waters. And let's also notice something else. If we look in the original Hebrew, how that this is God in the plural sense. Now, you can build a case, and some people do, especially Jewish people, uh, build a case that this is kind of the royal we. You know, how the kings and queens refer to themselves as we. We did this. And they try to make those verses I interpret those verses that way. Yet we who believe in the Trinity interpret that differently and note that the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost actively participated in the act of creation. Okay? 
So the fact that in the plural, when God is spoken of in the plural in these first two verses, makes absolute perfect sense to us. Okay? Now, the second the second day Genesis 1 3 through 5 and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night in the evening and the morning were the first day. So here we have the first day being complete when God divides the night from the day. Okay? Now, the second day, 6 through 8, and God said, Let there be a firmament, firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, this is a very complex description here. There is the water on the face of the planet. And it's pretty much well covering the entire face of the planet. And God took some of the water and used it to create the atmosphere or looking at it a different way as some people believe there was an ice canopy around the world. Um, separating the oceans which covered the world the world in its entirety from the atmosphere and the moisture that was up in the heavens now there are a substantial number of people over the years that have believed that there was an ice canopy around the world. And that's why, that's one way you can interpret these verses when it's talking about the firmament that's above. And it makes a lot of sense because when the great flood happened, how that there was so much moisture up there to completely destroy the face of the planet like that. And also, too, uh, that ice canopy was shielding uh, the population and the animals and what have you from the radiation from the sun and slowed down. With, that's the reason why the aging process was so slow we read in the early part of Genesis is because of that ice canopy. Now, if you don't believe that, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with you about it. Um, you could also be thinking of that as the separation of the water that's in the oceans from the moisture that's in the sky. Uh, and that would, that would work too. Um, but anyway, that was what happened on the second day. Okay, now on the third day, 
9 through 13, and God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one pl unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters uh, called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the sea, earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the truth tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Now we see how that God is making preparations for the animal kingdom and for, for mankind as he separates out and gathers the water to one place, the dry land to another place. And we also see how he's making uh, room, making it creates the vegetation. And an important thing that I do want to point out, even though, again, I'm not going to sit and argue with people, but an important thing that I want to point out, taking the Bible at face value, how that it keeps saying that these plants produce after its kind. Now, is it saying that absolutely every single apple on the tree is the exact mirror image of every other apple on the tree? No, it's not saying that. It's saying that an apple tree has an apple and an orange tree has an orange and a potato plant is producing a potato plant. It's not saying that some potato plants are going to be the same, might be bigger, some might be smaller. You may be able to cultivate them and get them to start growing a certain particular kind of way, but they're still going to be potato plants. That's what this is talking about. It's not saying that every single, uh, that there may not be a race of one thing and a race of another thing. It's just saying that if something's a thing, it's going to stay a thing. So if it's a potato, it may be you may be able to get uh, cultivate and that kind of thing till you come up with a sweet potato, and you may cultivate until you come up with a small small potato, and you may cultivate and come up with a large potato. But they all going to be potatoes. And that's what that's saying. And the way I interpret these verses, and the way I interpret the Bible, just taking it at face value, that's what the Bible says. And that's what I believe. Uh, but if you don't want to believe it that way, as long as you keep believing the Apostles' Creed, I'm not going to sit and argue with you about it. Okay? Anyway. Okay, now, a couple of concluding thoughts. The most important thing for us to take out of these verses, again, is that God has no beginning. God pre-planned this entire thing and very methodically designed it all because he loves us, he cares about us, and his intention is for our good 
and well-being. Now, as we begin to go through these, this story, we'll talk about how that mankind messed up, sin entered into the world, and therefore death was passed on to all the human race, and God, from the very beginning, made the promise of sending His only begotten Son to die on the cross, be resurrected, and in believing in Him and accepting Him is the only way to salvation. Well, friends, good Lord willing, I'll be with you next weekend for our next lesson.